hand clap in Tammy's honor. Amen. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. If you're a child that's fifth grade and below, you can go down the hallway all the way to the left, and Morgan is ready to uh, teach you down there. Praise God for our children's ministry. If you want to be a part of children's ministry and help out with that, my wife Julie here's in the front row, right? Are you mine? Okay, and then Katie, who's up at the front. Katie, say hey. Hey, did, did anybody get any muffins or, or some goodies to this morning? Amen. Thank you. Deb is normally there, but she's out of town. Thank you, Katie, for stepping in there. Hebrews chapter 1. We're beginning a brand new series today called What's Your Story? When you think about your story or you think about where you've been, where you're going, I believe that each and every one of us have met, I pray, we have met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His name is... And Jesus has radically changed our lives. If he has not radically changed your life, it's time for you to have a change of life. And Jesus is the one that's going to do that. In Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to talk about Jesus for a few minutes, but I want to give you an overview. Really, these next four weeks, I'm going to preach for three, and then my friend, my brother, Michael Hendricks, will preach for the last one, um, as I'll be in Cuba that week. But I want you to hear some things from the book of Hebrews that talks about how we deepen our walk with him. We deepen our walk with God. One of the greatest places I believe that you'll ever be is church. And I'm not talking necessarily about the community fellowship, but I like being here. Anybody else? Amen. Hey, I'm talking about the big C church. I'm talking about no matter where you are, we are the people of God, and we can step into a church that's maybe a Catholic church or a Presbyterian church or a non-denominational church or charismatic or Pentecostal, and we can find this man whose name is Jesus who is calling people to himself. And that's what's happening in the book of Hebrews. That's what's happening over at the Speedway today with those volunteers and the worship service that's just about going on right now with Jim Foster who's preaching. I am grateful that God is continually drawing us to him. Amen? He is continuing to do that. One of the greatest places to be is in church. Last week we celebrated Easter. We had a great time here. We had the largest crowd we've had in a good long time in 126 people. Um, we've been averaging a little over 100. But it's a time that we've lifted up Jesus and we're going to continue to do that. So one of the greatest places, church. How about one of the greatest books? And that is the book of Hebrews. I want you to think with me for just a few minutes how God wove together the 66 books of the Bible to teach us about who he is that changes our story. It's a powerful book. It's a gift given from God. It's, a, it's teaching us the depths of faith in God, and it's really what we need. Recently, we talked through a series called Core Values. I preached through some of it. Uh, Michael helped me with that one, but we talked about community, relevance, acceptance, creativity, authenticity, unity, and expectations. And we do all of that because God has called us as a church to demonstrate his love to this community. And why do we do that? So that we win the right to tell others about the one who matters most, Jesus, whether we have their attention for five minutes or 55 minutes. We want to tell them about what matters. That's why we're having this outreach this next weekend. That's why we are having some people over at the Speedway. It's why we're working on that new building over there that should be done any minute, Cast and Adams. But and in fact, God gave us some money and we're able to do a little bit more. Praise, praise God. Amen. And, and we got some more coming. I want you to think with me for just a few minutes about what are the specific things that God's doing in your life. Maybe this. What are the questions that you have about your faith? So, what is your story? Each of us have a connection to the one who loves us most, that's God. He not only loved us most, but he forgave our sins. He went to the cross that we talked about, he got up out of the grave for us, and he has centered our lives, our living, our thinking, our believing upon him, on eternity of what really matters most is what gets us to this eternity or gets us to the end or to the beginning, really, of really living. I want you to think about that. What is your story? What has God done in your life? Where is he leading you? What, what has he brought you through, just as Tammy reminded us about? How's life different? Answering those questions leads us to share our testimony with others. By the way, a testimony includes three things. David and Lori. Right, right? I mean, we, we do lots of testimonies in Celebrate Recovery. But it includes, number one, our life before Jesus. This is what I was like. This is what was going on. Two, how did you meet Jesus? For me, I, I've been to church all my life, and I realized one day that I needed this Jesus that I've been taught since the very beginning. And three, what's Jesus done since then? 
How am I walking with Jesus today? A testimony can last 30 seconds or it can last three hours. It doesn't matter. But you have a story that God has given you and he wants to continue to build your story. Answering those questions teaches us what Jesus has done in our life. So if you open your Bible into the book of Hebrews, you're going to see one of the most honest here, one of the most difficult books in the New Testament to exegete or to, to study. In fact, um, Revelation is the most difficult. Anybody else ever studied Revelation? I got questions, more questions I had before that I read Revelation than I had after Revelation. <laughs> Hebrews is that way. One of the reasons is, is because the author who wrote this had a deep understanding of the language, the Greek language, but he also had a deep understanding of the sacrificial laws of the Old Testament. By the way, when Jesus came, things changed. We didn't need a yearly sacrifice. We had a forever sacrifice. I don't know. I'm going to preach today. Y'all hang out, okay? I, I, four hours sleep is working on me. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, we, we look at the book of Hebrews. In chapter 11, we have this faith hall of fame with all these names. We're going to talk about those in a couple weeks. We, we have... In chapter 12, we have a reminder to look at Jesus and stay the course with Jesus and remove things around us, from around us, that are tying us up or tripping us up from following him. If you look a little bit deeper into this book, in chapter 6, you're going to find one of the most difficult, in my opinion, one of the most difficult chapters in all of the Bible because it talks about falling away or it talks about people who are choosing to walk away from Jesus. Now, I don't believe you can lose your salvation, but I believe you can stop walking in step with Jesus. And I want you to think today about some of that. How have you been led closer to God? How far are you feeling from God? If you feel far from Him, it's not Him that moves. All right, that's the story. I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, By faith, we must understand that God wants to help us work through the tough times. And by the way, we all have tough times. Struggles. We're going to find in these verses ahead of us, it's all about Jesus. The struggle in my life, it's all about Jesus. The good times, the celebration, all about Jesus. We're going to find that, that faith is all about What God has given us, it's all about what He gave us in the Son, His Son, that good gift. And He is good, He is God, He is better than anything else that is to come. And what comes against us, He's even better than that stuff. So I want you to note this. As I read or we read these five verses, I want you to note what sticks out to you. Stand with me as we read God's Word. It's going to be on the screen. Also hope that you have your Bible. You know, you may have it on on your phone or you may have it in, in in a... a real book. It's a real book there, but a paper book. I just want to encourage you to have a Bible because we need to go back to this stuff after we read it, okay? You read silently as I read aloud. It's going to be on the screen. Verse number one. Here we go. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to his son mm, as an inheritance. And through the Son, He created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is greater than the angels, just as the name God gave Him is greater than their names. Verse number 5. God never said to the angels, like he said to Jesus, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning and we thank you that you're going to open up this word, the scripture. The Bible literally says, as Bible study said this morning, that you breathed or you inspired the word. God, I pray that you speak to us today from the inspired word, your word, so that our lives will be transformed. For those who are listening or here today who have never asked you to be Savior, I pray that today would be that defining day. Whoever will call upon you will be saved. I pray it would be a day of salvation. But I ask that you open this book and help us to understand that when we struggle, we can have deeper faith rather than less faith. And we need this. I need it. And I I pray that all of us will seek, seek faith today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
We're not sure who the author is of the book of Hebrews, okay? It could be one of many, many different people. Maybe it was Paul because Paul had a a great learning and a great sense of understanding the language, the Greek language as well as the Old Testament. It could have been a man named Luke. Say Luke. That is not Luke and the father. That Okay, I just shouldn't even have brought that up today. But Luke, do you know what? He was a doctor. He was a very educated man. So most likely, he would have known the, Eng- the, the language, the English language. Haha. <laughs> he would have known the Hebrew as well as the Greek and Aramaic and some other things. He was a deep thinker, and he had some things that he could have taught us. Or maybe it was Timothy who was the disciple of Paul, right? Like the son, daddy in the faith, the son in the faith. Or maybe it was a man named Barnabas, son of encouragement, who was a, a deep, deep thinker who walked with Paul. So there's a lot of Pauline, or in other words, Paul-type writing that's here. We're not sure who it is. But does it really matter who the writer is other than to understand the things that are in this book of Hebrews line up with the rest of Scripture, all 66 books? And today I want to remind you that the people that are being written to are Jewish Christians. That's why it calls them often brothers and sisters. So this book, Hebrews, is written to believers. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, would you just say amen? Amen. And if you don't, I pray that you come to know him soon. This book is written to you. Do you know why it's written to you? Because back way then when the Hebrews and these people were hearing from God through this word, their lives were having some struggles. They were going through trouble. Anybody today? And I got some bills. Uh, You ain't met her. (laughs) I'd have to deal with her every day. I'm not talking about Julie, by the way. Um, Yeah, You know what? We we got struggles. We got a tough job. We We got a tough life. We got some stuff I did in the past that keeps catching up with me. All these things. In fact, here's what's going on in the life of the Hebrews, the people that was written to. They were having such a difficult time that many of them were saying, well, the heck with this, it's too difficult to follow Jesus. Let me tell you, it's not a bed of roses to walk with Jesus. I like roses. Anybody else? They smell good, and when they're coming up, oh, they're beautiful. Go ahead and pick one and see what happens to your hand. There's thorns on them roses. There's always, always difficulty in life, even if you choose to follow Jesus. In fact, if you choose to follow Jesus, you choose to have a target put on you by the enemy. And then the enemy says, I, ain't, I can't get you, but I'm going to try to get at you. I'm going to try to deceive you, and I'm going to try to get you offline. The reason why the book of Hebrews was written was written to Christians just like you and me who were struggling in their faith and wanted to go deeper with Jesus. How about you? I want to go deeper with Jesus. As we go deeper with him, I want to ask you a question. Is Jesus worth following? If Jesus is worth following, then listen to this. Is it worth the fight or the struggle or the temptation or, or more? Some things are worth the struggle. Some things are not. I heard it said years and years ago, what's worth having is worth fighting for. And faith is just one of those things. If you've got something called easy believism, you think that following Jesus is easy, you know what? You missed it because it's not always easy, but it's always right. Jesus is better than everything. He's superior to anything. He's able to care for us in spite of what we deal with. And this book reminds us that Jesus is better than the system, even the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. It's better than the system that we have to deal with from the world that's around us that's trying to wrap us around its mold. Do you see this happening? Look in the the media, the movies, and all the stuff going around us. They've got all these words that in our childhood or my childhood, they didn't have that on TV. They didn't show all that stuff. They're trying to desensitize us to the wrong things in the world so that we stop listening to the right things in the world. We desperately need Jesus. So how we view God matters. And today's sermon is really titled, How We View God. How we view God matters. Your perspective, my perspective matters. You see, if I look at the world and say it's too hard, I'm saying my God is too weak. If I look at the world and say, it's hard, but I got a big God, my view of God must be pretty big. I'll give you an illustration. Back there in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were supposed to go into the Holy Land, the Promised Land, right? They were going to go in the Promised Land. There were 12 spies, count them, 12 spies. And 10 of them said, those people in there are too big. Those problems are too much. But there were two spies who said, God said, we can take it. Let's take it. Are you part of the two or part of the ten? The way is wide that leads to destruction. The way is narrow that leads to life. I'm ready to go down to some narrow roads. Anybody else? It's a difficult road. Hebrews ought to give us some spring in our steps, some encouragement in our faith, and even some energy 
because we will not be shaken the stronger we are in our faith. So I want you to think about that. How we see God matters. And here's some things about him that ought to help us. Point number one, God continues to speak. Aren't you glad that God is still speaking today? You know, there was some time called the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament when God seemed silent. There are no scriptures that we have. There are some other Bibles that have some of that kind of stuff. I just pointed out two people there, not just weird right there. But, but there were some other things that happened during that time. But there are some times even in your life probably that God seemed silent. You know, I, I remember as a child, I went to church all the time, and it seemed like I heard God all the time. But then when I made some choices, went my way, it seemed like God was just not saying anything. You know what? He was still talking. I just quit listening. I want you to hear today and understand that God continues to speak. He was speaking way back then, and God is still speaking today. Listen to Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. And when Joshua was near to the town of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and he demanded, friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell on his face to the ground in reverence. I, I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. I want to tell you, if you will spend just a few minutes with Jesus every day, you're going to find some holy ground because God's going to begin to talk. Are you listening? He's speaking. That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Have I heard from him today? In fact, I think it was Abraham Lincoln that said this, I have so much to do today, I must need to spend time with Jesus before I do anything else. That's a little weird quote, but he, he said something very similar to that. I need Jesus. I don't know about you. I, I need Jesus to go to Walmart. Oh, shoot, wow. I, I need Jesus to drive around some of you people because y'all are crazy. You know what? I, I, Go to the Speedway with me this afternoon, and you see crazy, okay? We don't have drunk fans. We have over-beverage fans. I, I, I really think that I got a marriage proposal and a kiss on the cheek. He wasn't very pretty either. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was really weird. This guy that um, was sitting next to me on my cart, his friend was behind him, kind of keeping him from falling out of the cart. <coughs> and the guy behind me says, hey, that's my boss over there, and he's one of our volunteers in our ministry he said please don't go by there so he sees me because i know i'm drunk okay let's keep going over beverage not drunk uh, god is speaking even in the times when we have all the world stuff like he's consumed all that when we consume the world stuff god is still desiring to speak to us and understand or help us understand him i want you to hear what the scripture says here he said long ago god spoke many things at, at, at many times in many ways to our ancestors and through the prophets god spoke in many times but god spoke Here's the deal. God is still speaking, but God spoke. When the world questions, and the world still questions, God answers. Are, are we listening for his answers? You see, the world's got a lot of answers. I mean, go search for books, and you're going to find books on philosophy. You're going to find books on self-help. You're going to find books on marriage. You're going to find all kinds of things. But I want to tell you, the book of all books... The Bible is going to speak to what's going on in your relationships and in whatever questions you're asking. Today I want to tell you that God is continuing to speak. He spoke way back then when the world questioned, God answered. But the question is, are we listening? Because sometimes they, the Christians, uh, the Jewish people, the people of God, sometimes they quit listening, didn't they? Do, do you ever wonder why they were questioning God and God kept loving them? And they'd go do their own thing. And then they cry out to God, and then God showed up again. And God showed off again, and he loved them again. And you know what they did? They turned and went their own way again. And then they cried out to God. And you know what God did? God came back, and he loved his people again. Let me tell you why that happened. Because we serve a God of mercy and a God of grace who gives second and third and fourth, and he gives chances. It's time to turn back to Jesus, y'all. God is speaking. We need to be listening. God continued to show up in those times, and God was speaking through the, their ancestors, it says here, through the prophets here. God heard their cry, and he responded to them. It says that he, he, he spoke to them in many different places. Some of those places he spoke were very difficult places. Can you imagine being out in the desert for 40 years? I mean, we've got GPS. I got GPS on my phone. I got GPS in my vehicle. I got all kinds of things to tell me that I'm going the right way or the wrong way. Heck, I'm married so she can tell me what the right way and the wrong way, right? That's what marriage is about. Thank you, Lori. I heard your amen louder than anybody else's. But, but isn't it true? These people, for 40 years, 
went around and around. That desert, if you look at the map, it wasn't very big. I mean, it's not even as big as the Sahara out there in, the, in Africa and all that kind of... But they went around and around. Why? Because they wandered away from God. We are going to continue to wander on our own and be in trouble when we stop listening to the one who really wants to speak to us. He is speaking. We need to be listening. He speaks at difficult places in our lives. Aren't you glad that God showed up when you were at your lowest? Aren't you glad that that when you made those choices to take those drugs or to go that direction, or, or even in the difficulties of being behind bars, God the Father showed up and said, I love you this much. And He is still showing up. And He is still showing up. I'm grateful, Chandler, you shared your story. I'm grateful that God showed up that Sunday afternoon. Amen? And God continues to show up. Listen to John chapter 6, verse 58. He said, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. When we choose not to follow Jesus, we are going to die a horrible death. I'm not talking about the death. I'm not not talking about the pain of death. I'm talking about the death called hell. Are y'all with me? There, the, heaven and hell are real places, and there's going to be a spiritual death or a spiritual life. The choice is ours in front of us. Those who choose faith will listen to him, but there's a challenge to keep listening. I, isn't it a challenge to hear from him? God is still speaking. He's, he spoke in the last days. He's still speaking today. We'll talk more about that in just a second. He spoke to the prophets, but you know, even Jesus said, they didn't listen to the prophets. Why are they going to listen to me? Right? You remember that story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus? You know, the rich man, he, he died and he, he cried out because he saw this abyss or this, this big valley or this, bag, if you will, vacuum between the people in hell or the people that are going away from God and the people that were with God. And here's what he said. The rich man said, hey, will you please just go tell them? They wouldn't believe me. They wouldn't believe the prophets. I want to tell you, God is speaking, and there's some people that you and I are going to talk to, and they'll never accept Jesus. But we need to keep telling them. We need to keep telling them what the truth is, and the truth is named Jesus. So I want you to look at your story and understand that in the old times, Jesus talked. Praise God, he spoke, God spoke. But here's, here's the deal. Listen to verse number 2 real quick. He says, and now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Who is the son? He's spoken to us through his son, and God's promised everything to the son. Let me, let me kind of pour this out for a second. In the Old Testament, in the olden days, Jesus or God spoke. God would, would show up in situations, and then he'd, he'd leave. He'd come into situations, and he would bless his people, and he would continue to bless them even when they weren't blessing God. He would do great, great things. But every year there had to be some kind of sacrifice, and he told them, this is how you do this. This is how you get your sins and the sins of the people forgiven. But here's what happened. That was then, and now this is today. Jesus shows up. In the old times, he spoke in many ways through many different things. But now in these final days, he has spoke to us through his son. Listen, we have the son of God who was sent from God to be the savior of the people, you and me. If we'll just believe him, believe in our heart that God sin has done and confess with our mouth that Jesus is the son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Do you know why that is? Because God sent the son so that you and I could have life. I want you to think about that. There's thoughts. When it talks about the final days here, it's not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about the difference of Old Testament to New Testament. The difference from how God worked then to how God works now. Now, what do we see is the linear goodness or truth in all of this is that God was speaking. He spoke then. He speaks now. And he will continue to speak to us. So God still shows up through Jesus. This last thing definitely means he's talking to us in the New Testament. But Jesus, here's the deal. The world is still in a mess. And Jesus is still the answer. He, He was the answer in 30 A.D. when he died on the cross. He was the answer in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve took that forbidden fruit. And by the way, tomorrow and the next day when you take that whatever it is that's twisted by the world and swallow it hook, line, and sinker as the old saying goes, Jesus will still be your answer. He is the answer of the world. Listen to John chapter 1 verse 14. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. 
and we saw his glory, or we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Tony Evans said it this way, Jesus put on flesh to make God known. Isn't that good? Jesus put on flesh to make God known. How many of y'all were at our Easter lunch and, and, and that kind of stuff we had over there? Some of y'all were, it was good, it was good. And, and we had somebody dress up as an Easter bunny. And, and bunnies, eggs, all that kind of stuff, and I'm not making... But some of those kids were just enamored by the Easter bunny. Isn't that true? I mean, it's just, look, mama, okay, all that kind of stuff. You know, may, maybe there's something that needs to show you that Jesus is true. Do you know one reason why people don't believe that Jesus is true? Because they never look at him. Do, do, you know, do you know one reason why you doubt your faith? Is maybe because you're making other things more important than your faith. How much time are you spending in the Word? You and I have an opportunity in front of us to take the person of God through the Word of God and plant Him in our life so we can become the people of God who can fight against the world because God is with us and around us and always for us. This is better preaching than you're letting on, by the way. Okay. It doesn't end here. God spoke in the past. God is now speaking through His Son, and He will continue to speak to us. Why? Because salvation comes through none other. That's what it says in this scripture here, that it's all about Jesus. He is the inheritance, He is the holder, He has been part of creation, and all of that. Listen to Romans chapter 4, verse number 7. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Why is this? Because the purpose of the Son was to reconnect the people to the Father. Jesus didn't come to become a king on a throne who rules and judges. Jesus came to be God on the cross, taking our wrongs so that we could be made right. Do you, do you know this guy, Jesus? Colossians 1.16, For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth, and he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and dominions, rulers and authorities in the sun seen world, and everything was created through him. This is Jesus. Everything created through him and for him. And here's what Jesus was given, the inheritance of everything. So let me give you some thought, okay? Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Therefore, God gives salvation. Jesus, it says here, is the heir of all salvation or the heir of all things, literally. And all things came into being through him. He is the creator and the holder of all. Romans 9, 5, Isaac, or excuse me, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was the Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. So first of all, we want to understand that God is still speaking. He's continuing to speak. Point number two is this. God continues to be seen. How is he seen today? He is seen in the lives of the people, his church, who are living for him. Question, if you were arrested today for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? We can say that all day long, but is there? I, I, I pray. Our prayer ought to be, God, will you please save that person in my family or that friend of mine or, or, or that person that's so heavy in my heart? Well, here's the deal. They might not even know the Bible or want to read the Bible, but how about you be in the Bible so they can read Jesus? God continues to be seen today. The Bible says here in verse number 3, this is good, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. I want to give you some thoughts on that one. The Son radiates the Father. Listen to this. To be able to see the Father, you have to first see the Son. John 14, 7. If you had really known me, you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. See, this is what Jesus was saying. You see me, now you've seen my Father. Do you ever look at somebody and you're like, I know your daddy, I know your mama. I went back there in the back, Sam, and your little girl was in front of Chelsea. And I'm like, oh, my, that's Chelsea's little... I mean, just, you could tell. So sometimes kids just look like... It's amazing, isn't it? I, I had a pastor years ago. His name was Michael Clonch, and they adopted a little boy. And that little boy they adopted looks just like Pastor Michael in my life. 
It was amazing how God puts that together in those situations. Jesus came to be, listen, the radiance of the Father. Let me give you some words for radiance. A mirror image of the Father. Do you know when I look best? It's when I get out of the shower and the mirror is all fogged up. I look like a million dollars at that point. And then the fog goes off and I'm like, put on some clothes, son. <laughs> Jesus was a mirror. Now, please, no. Wipe it off, okay? Not the mirror. Um, <laughs> Jesus is the mirror image of the Father. If you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. No, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Think about that. Jesus reflected the Father. Jesus showed them the Father. Here you go. Jesus pointed them to the Father. Do you know what we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be becoming more like the Son. Why? So that we can show them the Father, we can look like the Father, and we can point people to the Father. Why? Because the Father's the one that has all the answers, not you and not me. Money's not going to an- handle your problem. Y- your spouse is not going to handle your problem. Definitely not your job's not going to handle your problem. And even the government's not. Well, you think the government's going to take care of your problem. That's not going to happen. It's Jesus that's going to take care of our problems. Jesus is a mirror image of the Father. Listen to this. The Son must be like the Father. Why? Because He is, they were one and the same. But we too must be like the Father. He is making us more and more like Jesus, which must, makes us more and more like the Father. You see, Jesus was an exact representation. There was a tight connection. You remember what Jesus did? All the way through those three and a half years that He was around, He spent time with the Father. He would get by Himself and He'd spend time praying. Why? Because He needed to hear from the Father. We need, if Jesus needed it, we must need it. We need time with the Father, time in the Word, time in prayer. Why? Because we need to become more and more like Jesus, to be the exact representation of Him. You know the reason why the church is so messed up today? It's because the people are so messed up today. And you is the people, and so am I. Okay, I just want to remind us, we need to become more and more like Jesus. Did you know what? The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, Paul says it, I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ lives within me. So let me give you a question. If you go to the funeral home, I'm not meaning to offend, but if you go to the funeral home and you see your friend or your family member laying in that casket, is that friend or family member going to get up and tell you what to do? If they do, you might want to get up and run. (laughs) But typically, the only one that's ever gotten out of the grave and stayed out of the grave, Jesus. We celebrated it last week. So I want to tell you that a dead person doesn't have any rights. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer... I who live, but Christ lives within me. Do you know what your right is? Look like Jesus. Live like Jesus. Does that mean he wants you to have no fun? No. He wants you to enjoy life. And the best way to enjoy abundant life is to listen to him and understand him and go do what he tells you to do. And watch him bless your life all along the way. The Father shares the glory of God. Listen, Romans 8, 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Life isn't easy. Listen, Hebrews. You're choosing to do your own thing. It's hard to follow Jesus. But it sure is blessed. Friend, you're going to come across situations, you're going to come across people, you're going to come across things that are going to make you think, is following Jesus even worth it? I want to tell you today, take another chance. Try Him again. Take another look. Open the Word of God. Listen again. Maybe turn on the Christian radio, or or maybe open up that Christian TV station and see what God says. You know what? He may show up when you least expect Him, because He is still speaking. He used to speak, and He still speaks today, and He is speaking through His Son, and He may even speak through you. Illustration of that, back in the book of Numbers, there was a situation when a donkey even talked. I believe that can happen again today. You mean to show you why? I just talked. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Hee-haw. I'm not a, not a Democrat, by the way, so that, that, some of y'all will get that in a minute. Um, Jesus was always pointing to somebody. I, I'll illustrate Do you know what happens in humanity today? We're always saying it's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's fault. Do you know what we ought to be saying like Jesus did? It's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me. It's about him. And when you and I continue to get offended, we continue to say, I'm more important than Jesus. Do you know what the premise behind the book of Hebrews is? Jesus is greater than. 
And when you and I get that in order, we're going to see the blessings of God in our lives. We're going to see him heal our marriages. We're going to see him take us to the next level that we can't even get to on our own because Jesus is greater than everything else. We need to always be hearing him. Why? Because the son shows us the father. The Bible says here that not only is he the radiance of God, but he is the exact representation. He is showing us the character of God. The same character of the father was the character of the son. He was a savior, the God who loved, and he was the savior, the son who came. I want to tell you this. Not only did he he create the world, you can look in John chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 1 to talk about creation, but he's also the one that sustains the world. If we think that he can create everything, why do we not think that he can take care of everything in our lives he sustains it all the son had a purpose and that purpose was to forgive sins he cleanses us this is really really good listen the son radiates the God, god's own glory and expresses the very character of god he sustains everything by his mighty power the power of his command and when he had cleansed us from our sins that's what he does best see i can't do it on my own It's all about him. It's what he did, Hebrews 9, 12, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves like the old covenant or the old sacrificial law. With his own blood, not the blood of goats or calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption. It is the finished work of God sitting in heaven. This is really good, and I'm going to step ahead. This is really, really good. In the Old Testament, say Old Testament. Okay, I want you to think about this for a second. In the Old Testament, every year they had to make a sacrifice. If you understand that, say uh uh-huh. Okay, they had to be a sacrifice. When when the, the high priest would go into the holiest of holy places, he would go to the place called the mercy seat, and he would sprinkle blood. Let me tell you about that room. In that room, there were several things, including the mercy seat, but there were no chairs. Y'all okay? What are you sitting on? A chair, okay? There were no chairs like that. Listen up. The Bible says when Jesus, verse number 3 toward the end of it, when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down. Listen to this. He sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Here's the deal. When the high priest went in, he had nowhere to sit down because his work was never completed. When Jesus forgave our sins, he sat down because The work of God was complete. I no longer have to have a sacrifice. I have a Savior who sacrificed for me. I want you to understand today that in old times, God spoke, but in these times, Jesus speaks. You know what? He is continuing to give us life. So when life gets hard, turn to Jesus. When you can't handle it, ask the one who can handle it to handle it for you. I remind you today that Jesus is better than all of this stuff in our lives. He is greater than the angels. The, see, the angels had purpose, and their purpose was to worship God. Jesus' purpose, purpose was to be God to the people. You see, when Jennifer and the band are up here, they are not the ones that are being Jesus to you. Jesus may flow through them through the Word, just like He does through the sermon. He flows through us, or, or through us through the Word. He, but, but Jesus was God Himself. I love that fact in John chapter 1, verse number 14 that I read to you a little earlier. But listen... It went, went, This is good. This is good. And and verse number four, this shows that the son is greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their name. Listen to Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 11. Therefore, God elevated him. That's Jesus. God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name that is above every name. Listen to this. Um, Do do we have it on the screen here? Uh, Okay, listen to Philippians chapter 2 again. Therefore God elevated him to the highest places of honor and gave him the name that's above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus is the Lord, the glory of the Father. Listen to this. It is at the name of Jesus that every knee bows and every tongue confesses. You trying to get to heaven some other way, you are going the wrong way. Listen, you trying to deal with your sin, your struggle, your shame, another way other than Jesus, you dealing with it the wrong way. Why? Because Jesus is the only answer for the world today. He is greater than everything else we deal with. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. Satan, who is the God of the world, has blinded the mind of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact 
likeness of God. Again, Jesus, the exact likeness of God who came to be the word of God to the people of God so they could be saved by God. When Jesus finished his work, he sat down with the Father. When you and I do our work, we'll never ever get done until we get Jesus to do the work for us. And he's done the hard things for us. Listen, John 19, verse number 30. Last week we talked about this. Listen to this. It is finished. I hate it when somebody breaks those brownies or those chocolate chip cookies and they're all gone. Don't you just hate it? But I want to tell you, when Jesus said it is finished, the plate was clean, the bowl was empty, and it was the plate and the bowl that had all our sin on it. It was gone. It was empty. And it needed no more. So why do we keep going back and wallowing in the same old bowl, in the same old plate, in the same old problem when Jesus has already taken care of the problem? The Bible says that we can bring our problem to the altar. We can bring our burden to the altar and leave it there because we have a God who loves us, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light, and he wants to give us rest. So you know what you and I most often do? We take our burden to Jesus and we say, oh, Jesus, you take this, and then we turn right back around and we pick up our burden. We try to deal with it ourselves. God wants to ask you today to do something for him. Lay it down. Lay it down. Stop picking it up and stop doing it yourself because Jesus wants to do it with you and for you. When Jesus finished his work, he completed it. Listen to this. He is, uh, this is good. He is God in the flesh who became God to man, to us. In verse number five, for God never said to the angels, but he said to Jesus, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God also said, "It is I, or I will be his father and he will be my son. Today, if you don't know the son of God, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, if you don't know the savior of the world, I invite you to get to know the savior of the world because he is now sitting in heaven because his hands have been washed His work is done. You and I can rest in Jesus that my situation, my struggle, my pain, my hate, my bitterness, my everything that I can't deal with by myself has been dealt with by the one who can deal with it best. Let me tell you, you got a plumbing problem, you go right ahead and fix it, but don't call me because you're going to have a worse problem when I show up. I'll give you a telephone number, 276-629-7001. Ask for Cassim Adams. He'll answer your problems. He can't answer it. I, nobody can. Okay, that's, that's, but you understand what I'm saying. You need to call somebody that knows. And I'll tell you what I know is that without Jesus, I'm lost. Your struggle may be pushing you to say Christianity is not worth it. I want to tell you today, try him again. Because he's not done with you. Don't be done with him. Father God, we come before you today and we thank you that you continue to speak and you continue to change our story. God, I pray that we would be listening and responding more than we ever have before. Oh God, we need you. I just confess it out loud and maybe you need to confess it out loud. Oh God, I need you. Today and tomorrow and the days ahead. God, I ask you forgive me because I've taken up all of my own stuff, my struggles, my worries, and I've tried to deal with it by myself. God, I need you because I can't deal with this stuff anymore. Father, I pray that you take our family and you make them stronger and you draw them to you. God, I pray that you take our church and when we struggle or we think that things are going to go in the wrong way, Lord, remind us that you got it and you take care of it. Lord, today we need you. And we thank you for who who you are and what you've done. And we pray this in your prayer.